So thanks so much to Dr. Dan Gold and to the Gino Group for inviting me to come speak today. Um, I'm uh, Scott Grossman. I'm an assistant professor in the neurology department at NYU in Manhattan in New York City. And I have uh, training and interest in neuroophthalmology and also in the neurological uh, side of neurotology and uh, spent a little bit of time last year down with the group at Johns Hopkins and Dr. Gold in Baltimore. And I'm really uh, thrilled today to be able to talk to the group about pontine and midbrain ocular motor disorders. And I know this is a complicated topic and uh, one that encompasses a number of different conditions, but I'm gonna try to go through it slowly and use a number of videos from Dr. Gold's collection on the novel uh, neuroophthalmology website that helps us uh, understand some of the syndromes that we may be seeing. And I really wanna take a practical approach to talk about what kind of complaints and presentations people may come into your office with as neurotologists um, if they have uh, one of these conditions. So this is an outline of my talk today. I know it seems like a busy slide and a long one, but I uh, don't want everyone to try to read it uh, right off the bat. I'm gonna to touch base uh, first on some of the anatomy and physiology underlying um, pontine and midbrain oculomotor disorders. I know we've talked about this in the past couple of sessions um, that have been done earlier in the year. Then I'll spend some time going through some individual different disorders uh, that can affect the midbrain. Then some that can uh, originate with pontine injury, including the medial longitudinal fasciculus syndrome, which can also uh, occur in the setting of midbrain uh, injury. And then I'll just uh, wrap up with some conclusions. So to first talk about some of the anatomy and physiology, many of us know that eye movements are an essential aspect of the way that we experience the world because they bring into our um, object of regard onto our point of greatest visual acuity on our retina, which is our fovea. And eye movements serve a purpose that's very important by allowing us to focus on an object and we use two major classes of eye movements to help focus on an object. We use saccades, which are fast conjugate eye movements that refixate the fovea on a target and are some of the fastest movements propagated by the human body, up to 700 degrees of uh, movement per second. And our eyes can also pursue movements called smooth pursuit, in which the eyes slowly track an object as it moves in space, and we maintain conjugate fixation on that object. By way of review, we have six different uh, muscles that are involved with ocular motility that are innervated by three different cranial nerves, and you can see them listed here with their respective directions, as well as a uh, busy uh, picture, just an overview of those muscles and some of their innervation. This um, figure on the right is an important one and one that I'm going to come back to throughout the talk today. It's a sagittal sideways view slice looking through the brainstem with uh, midbrain pons and medulla depicted in this cartoon, as well as a number of important structures that play essential roles in ocular motility. And they include the trochlear nucleus, cranial nerve four, located around the level of the inferior colliculus, as well as the ocular motor nucleus for cranial nerve three, that's around the level of the superior colliculus. Um, other important uh, things outlined here include those in the medulla, which I'm not gonna focus on today because those will be focused on uh, in a future date um, by Dr. Gold or others. In addition, the abducens nucleus, cranial nerve six, is located here in the dorsal pons and sends off the sixth fascicle, the portion of the nerve that runs within the parenchyma of the brainstem uh, to innervate the ipsilateral lateral rectus. And we also know that the important structure, the MLF, medial longitudinal fasciculus, contains interneurons from the sixth nerve nucleus that cross and ascend um, towards the cranial nerve three nucleus. In addition, the uh, PPRF, or paramedian pontine reticular formation, contains some horizontal burst neurons that are important for initiating um, uh, gaze in the horizontal direction and maintaining eccentric gaze. And the RIMLF, rostrointerstitial uh, MLF, is responsible for torsional fast phases and for vertical saccades or vertical eye fast movements. Another important structure, the NPH that we talked about, will be discussed further in further detail later on. And finally, the INC, interstitial nucleus of Cajal, 
is a nucleus that's important for vertical and tor horizontal uh, torsional gaze holding. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about individual syndromes that can occur rel relative to midbrain injury. And the first is an important one that I see not rarely in the office in my clinical practice as a neuro-ophthalmologist in New York. And this is something called Perino syndrome, which is also named after its anatomical localization, the dorsal midbrain syndrome. And it is characterized by a clinical tetrad. It has four components. The first one is upgaze restriction, which is um, notably a supranuclear deficit insofar as if we attempt to use the VOR or the doll's head maneuver to overcome that uh, deficit, we can do so. The syndrome also includes light near dissociation of the pupils in which the pupillary response is minimal or reduced to light exposure. But when we ask individuals to focus at an object that near and can converge their eyes, the pupil does constrict uh, an accommodative function. In addition, when we ask patients to uh, quickly look up um, with rapid upgaze, rather than being able to look up as a normal subject would be able to, they manifest a phenomenon called convergence retraction nystagmus, in which the eyes converge in a spas uh, spasmic manner and also retract into the globe. Um, the globes retract into the orbit, and that's best visualized from a lateral approach. Finally, the fourth component of the clinical tetrad of Perino syndrome is lid retraction or Collier sign, and that's depicted down here in a figure from a paper uh, in, to uh, senior neuro-ophthalmologist, Drs. Valerie Buse and Nancy Newman. Um, and you can see here that the eyelid position is high riding even though it is symmetric, it's high riding above the superior aspect of the iris, and that's known to be consistent with so-called Collier sign or lid retraction. Patients can often manifest a surprised kind of look. So how might this patient come into clinic? Um, sometimes people can complain of a sense of their visual world jumping, especially in attempted upgaze. In addition, um, because of the etiology of these symptoms, sometimes individuals can also have headache. One of the most frequent clinical scenarios in which I see Perino syndrome is with individuals who have a mass of the pineal gland that exerts manual compression onto the dorsal midbrain. For example, in pinealomas or PPTID, another malignancy of the pineal gland. Um, and I have several cases that I follow in clinic for this complaint. In addition, <clears throat> you can also have ischemic damage to the dorsal midbrain or demyelinating lesions of the dorsal midbrain. Um, that can result in Perino syndrome. So now let's take a chance to look at a video that comes from Dr. Gold's collection of a clinical uh, manifestation of Perino syndrome. Here we see the lid retraction with the superior aspect of the sclera visible above the iris. Here. Um. Now we see smooth pursuit. And this individual has limited abduction of the left eye. An attempted upgaze, saccade, there he manifests convergence retraction nystagmus. You see the eyes are coming together and also they are retracting into the orbit. As you can imagine, this may result in a sense of oscillopsia with the visual world oscillating at a rate that's similar to the, eyelid, uh, the uh, globe retraction. There, despite the limitation in volitional upgaze, there is an intact vestibulocular reflex in the vertical plane. Here's another example of the dorsal midbrain syndrome of someone with a pineal GBM. Pupils are minimally constricting to light. When we ask him to focus at near, you can see the pupils do constrict in a symmetric manner. 
will again see convergence retraction nystagmus and attempted upgaze saccade. <clears throat> and here just conversion with attempted upgaze. Here we've taken a lateral view of the eyes to see if we can better appreciate the retraction component of this convergence retraction nystagmus. This is just a slow mo motion view of the convergence retraction nystagmus that this patient has in attempted upward saccades. So now let's move on away from parano syndrome and focus on so-called progressive supranuclear palsy, PSP, as well as some disorders that can mimic PSP, which is a primary neurodegenerative condition that affects the midbrain. And I'll again ask the question, how would this patient maybe present to you in clinic? And in neurology, we think about PSB in a couple different scenarios, including individuals who have frequent falls because of the clinical manifestations of PSP, which include oculomotor dysfunction with deficits in both motility range, as well as speed of saccades or saccadic slowing, postural instability, akinesia, meaning absence of movement, and cognitive dysfunction. And this set of clinical manifestations can really come together in a perfect storm that makes people a fall risk if they can't both can't see where their feet are. They have gait changes and postural instability. These individuals can have a really tough time uh, walking. And these criteria were also formalized in a set of diagnostic criteria from 2017 that the Movement Disorder Society produced to be able to diagnose PSP. So, Let's take a second to look at some of the oculomotor signs in PSP. Here we see limitation in range of vertical gaze. That again improves with VOR. This individual also has a uh, abnormality in primary gaze when we ask patients to look straight ahead. Individuals can have eye deviation that's conjugate off of their target and then back to their target. They typically deviate, deviate conjugately, to one, uh, conjugately to one side and then back to target and that's termed square wave jerk. Square wave jerks can be normal in older individuals but can be increased in disorders like PSP. Smooth pursuit here is not smooth, rather it's psychotic or broken as the individual tracks a target in space. When we ask her to saccade to target in the lateral plane, the saccades are hypometric, meaning they fall short of target, and then she's required to take a catch-up saccade to meet her target, another feature of PSP. And this is clear both with eccentric saccades and also saccades back to midline. Another feature of PSP, so-called astonished facies, it's a classic appearance of the face. And the procerus sign is the crease that you see here in between the eyebrows, um, that muscles of procerus and um, can have this abnormal appearance in individuals with PSP. 
What Dr. Gold's demonstrating here is this applause sign where patients will be asked to clap just three times in a row and uh, cannot inhibit themselves from clapping beyond that. Um, and so you heard her clap four times when he asked her to clap only three. The important thing to point out is that the anatomy underlying abnormalities in PSP most closely localizes to the dorsal midbrain white matter abutting the region of the RMLF, and this was demonstrated in an elegant study from Dr. Adam Boxer and colleagues at UCSF who correlated the loss of vertical saccade velocity with eye movement recording in a voxel-based cor um, correlation with volume loss of the white matter in the dorsal midbrain. And as we mentioned earlier, the saccadic speed is just as important an abnormality in PSP as a psychotic range. So when we are referred patients by movement disorders colleagues in neuro, to neuroophthalmology, one of the most important things that we look for is psychotic speed at the bedside. Importantly, there are a couple other primary neurodegenerative conditions that can be on the differential diagnosis for PSP. These include things like multiple system atrophy, Parkinson's disease, idiopathic, or normal aging in which older individuals can also have restricted range of vertical, um, especially up gaze. Um, but other conditions that are not neurodegenerative that can mimic PSP include the prion disease, Creutzfeldt-Jakob, in which people can have frequent square wave jerks and uh, gaze uh, deficits like we're describing, as well as Whipple's disease, which is an infectious um, entity from the uh, organism T. Uh, trip trypanosome Whippoli, um, and can be um, uh, clinically very similar to PSP as well. Now we'll move on to a couple different name syndromes that uh, frequently can occur in the midbrain. And these were all named in the 19th century for different individuals who characterize them, including Weber syndrome, Benedict syndrome, and Claude syndrome. So Weber syndrome <clears throat> is the uh, clinical syndrome that occurs when a fascicular, meaning the fascicle of the third cranial nerve is co-occurring with an individual who has contralateral hemiparesis that can originate in the cerebral peduncle, which is seen here in this uh, slide that outlines the cerebral peduncle as well as the, the fascicle of third. And Weber syndrome is characterized by the ocular position of down and out, lid droop, dilated pupil, as well as contralateral hemiparesis. Benedict syndrome is somewhat more um, dorsal in its location and is involving a third nerve palsy on one side with contralateral abnormal movements, typically choreoform or a tremor because of co-localization between the fascicle of the third cranial nerve and the red nucleus, um, which when injured can result in this kind of abnormal movements or the substantia nigra. And here's our trusty um, diagram of the lateral aspect of the brainstem showing the localization of where a fascicular third red nucleus lesion would occur. Claude syndrome, manifest when there's a nuclear third, but can, uh, along with ataxia and confusion and involves the superior cerebellar peduncle, red nucleus, and the MLF. And here's a video of someone who has a third nerve palsy on one side and contralateral cerebellar signs, tremor, dysmetria, and ataxia. Here he does have bilateral ptosis, related to the fact that um, the anterior palpebrae is bilaterally innervated. see bilateral thalmoparesis, as well as ataxia or abnormality in his gait, requiring two-person assist to walk. <laughs> 
a tremor that's so-called rubral tremor coming from the red nucleus because rubral means red. It's large amplitude and hyperkinetic. And the point we really want to make with this is that if someone comes into the office, has some of these peripheral neurologic signs of dysmetria or ataxic gait, and also has abnormalities in eye movement, that's a concerning constellation of symptoms that localizes to the midbrain. And those individuals should be referred to an ER or an emergent setting for more emergent evaluation. This is just a table that summarizes the different names or eponyms of syndromes, uh, including some of the ones that we described here. And the most important part of the slide, from my point of view, is the dates at which the syndromes were described, um, almost all of which occurred before um, the 1920s. Now we'll talk briefly just about isolated third cranial nerve lesions and fourth cranial nerve lesions. So the fourth cranial nerve, like we talked about uh, here, is at the level of the inferior colliculus. And, um, the more um, lossful aspect of the dorsal midbrain. And the fourth cranial nerve is unique in that it's fascicle and the origin of the nerve exits on the opposite side of the brainstem and then loops around to innervate the eye muscle that the fourth is responsible for, the superior oblique. Whereas the third cranial nerve, sixth cranial nerve, and other um, cranial nerves typically exit the brainstem on the ventral side. Because the fourth cranial nerve is so superficial, the nucleus is so superficial to the dorsal aspect of the brainstem. There's also a very small difference between a nuclear fourth cranial nerve palsy and a fascicular fourth cranial nerve palsy because of the anatomy here. So let's take a minute to look at a video of a, a isolated fourth cranial nerve palsy. And this patient was from a left midbrain hemorrhage. On the cover uncover test, we can see that the eyes realign when asked to focus on target. The right eye shifts down and the left eye shifts up consistent with the right hypertropia that increases in right head tilt. And decreases in left head tilt. And you can see the lesion here in the left midbrain that localizes to that constellation of uh, findings on cover on cover testing. This SWI sequence is a MRI sequence that helps us visualize blood. And this um, dark area here is consistent with the hemorrhage in the midbrain on the left. With regard to third nerve palsies, um, the important distinction to make is between nuclear third nerve palsies and fascicular third nerve palsies. And that's because, as we said, a nuclear third nerve palsy will cause bilateral ptosis because of the presence of this uh, subnucleus, the CCN, within the third cranial nerve nucleus here, and also conjugate bil uh, limitation and bilateral upgaze, um, as we witnessed in the prior video of that gentleman with the ataxia and the Claude syndrome. By contrast, a fascicular third will manifest more with unilateral findings. So let's take a look at some examples of uh, central third nerve palsies. This first one, I believe, is fascicular. So just to be clear though, these were both examples of individuals who had damage to the CCN for, for nuclear um, isolated thirds because of the bilateral restriction and upgaze and downgaze. Finally, uh, isolated INC lesions or nuclear, interstitial nucleus alcohol lesions. This is one of the most prominent group, uh, cell groups within the medial longitudinal fasciculus. 
the projections to the vestibular nuclei. We know it's essential for vertical eye movement to maintain, maintaining vertical eccentric gaze in a steady manner. And a lesion to it can promote, um, provoke nystagmus, either an upward gaze, a downward gaze, as well as some abnormalities of twisting of the head, um, similar to torticola. Um, and there's been thought that perhaps in the future stimulation of this uh, nucleus, the INC, could lead to uh, help uh, treatment of individuals who have cervical dystonia or forced dystonic position of their cervical musculature. Um, perhaps stimulation of INC would be able to, to improve it in the future. Now we're going to switch gears and talk more about pontine disorders and start with the MLF syndrome, medial longitudinal fasciculus syndrome, which includes the INO, uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, but as we're going to learn about and talk about, there are many more manifestations of the MLF syndrome um, than just the INO. Here's some videos of the INO that show abduction, adduction paresis of the left eye here, clearly with saccadic um, delay and diminished gaze uh, range of the left eye and adduction. Here's another um, left INO with concurrent abducting nystagmus of the right eye and right gaze, whereas there's no nystagmus, but only limited motility range of the left eye and left gaze. Every one of these individuals had vascular risk factors and had a stroke that affected the MLF that uh, led to uh, INO. In this patient, Dr. Gold is evaluating them with what's called an optokinetic drum, which is a series of lines that are moved uh, in front of the patient's eyes as they're asked to focus on those lines. And that's a way of testing both fast eye movements, saccades, <clears throat> and slow eye movements, smooth pursuit. So here we can see that with leftward saccades, fast eye movements, there's an adduction lag of the right eye, meaning that there's a right eye and O. That's more subtle here than in the first two cases in this video. <clears throat> and remember, this is a diagram from the University of Iowa's excellent website on um, ophthalmology and neuroophthalmology that details the underlying anatomy of the MLF and therefore the INO. And the MLF is depicted uh, here in connection between the sixth cranial nerve nucleus and the third cranial nerve nucleus. And we know that unilateral damage to that um, uh, structure is, is what leads to the INO because it uh, de-yokes the third cranial nerve from the sixth cranial nerve um, with preservation of the direct connection between the sixth nerve nucleus and the uh, lateral rectus muscle. However, there are a lot of other different manifestations of the MLF syndrome beyond just the intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. And an important one is something called the ocular tilt reaction. Um, <clears throat> And this is a reaction, a compensatory reaction of our eyes that includes a couple different components, including a skew deviation, meaning a vertical misalignment of the eyes that does not um, represent a cranial nerve palsy, like a third cranial nerve or fourth cranial nerve palsy, an ocular counter roll, and head tilt. Um, and this is important because it can also be a result from uh, diminished input from the utricle which is the structure in our inner ear that is gravity dependent. And a test was developed that's depicted here in this paper from the resident and fellow section of the neurology journal from two different neuroophthalmologists showing that when we have vertical double vision, vertical diplopia, if there's a major change in the degree of that diplopia or the degree of deviation between the two images going from a change in position from upright to supine, <clears throat> then that indicates that the utricular pathway is involved because those pathways are gravity dependent, whereas other reasons for our eyes to be vertically deviated are not gravity dependent. And so that's one reason that people use the upright supine test <clears throat> to help determine if there's absence of utricular input from the um, um, inner ear um, that uh, may indicate an MLF uh, lesion. This is also discussed in a paper from Dr. Gold and the former fellow, Dr. Kamar Green, 
uh, talking about the skew deviation in acute vestibular neuritis. This was published in Journal of Neuroophthalmology last year. <clears throat> we mentioned briefly the ocular counter roll. And the, this is a, a little bit complicated, but basically these fundus photos here in the bottom of the slide show that there is a torsional component to this individual's um, eye position. <clears throat> and so we know that, um, when, as we can see in this anatomic docu uh, diagram down here, if there's a lesion in the vestibular nucleus or in the vestibular apparatus um, on one side, there's unopposed unilateral input from one utricle, and that synapses on the vestibular nucleus then ascends through the MLF, uh, synapses on the contralateral sixth, sixth nerve nucleus, INC and third nerve nucleus, leading to torsional movement of the eyes. Here, if there's a left vestibular nucleus lesion, then the ipsilateral eye will be excyclotorted and the contralateral eye will be encyclotorted. <clears throat> and the important thing to know is that this um, uh, will lead uh, to a shift in the eye uh, torsional position that is the opposite of what one would expect in a fourth nerve palsy. So with um, ocular tilt reaction, the uh, eyes are vertically deviated and the, the lower eye, the, here in this context, the right eye, um, will be extorted, whereas the higher eye will be intorted. And the opposite is true in a fourth nerve palsy because the action of the superior oblique is to intort the eye that's affected. So if there's damage to that intorting muscle, the superior oblique, the eye will be excyclodeviated. The higher eye um, will be excyclodeviated. And there's also a way of measuring this in neuroophthalmology with um, double matic, what's called double Maddox rod that measure the way that our eyes uh, are, are torted or turned. There's also a um, recent attention has been paid to nystagmus associated with MLF syndrome including upbeat nystagmus and up gaze and downbeat and down gaze. And this is seen more frequently with bilateral MLF injury. And this is <clears throat> thought to be related to disruption of the utricular pathways um, or vertical semicircular canal pathways. So let's take a look at an example of that. This is a left MLF syndrome with upbeat torsional nystagmus, left INO and askew with a left hypertropia. <laughs> Here we see upbeat nystagmus on the right eye here. Here's a video oculographic depiction of the right eye's upbeat torsional nystagmus. And this may be more related to uh, anterior canal damage, whereas if it's the posterior canal that's affected, um, the nystagmus would be more downbeat torsional. Here we see a greater torsional component with the left eye and more of an upbeat component in the right eye. And just to note that there's, when we see torsional nystagmus in the setting of an acute MLF injury, as in this gentleman, it's almost always on the same side as the um, lesion to the MLF, meaning the left here. We also see a diminished adduction of the left eye for a left eye mill. this gentleman had a stroke leading to these symptoms. So moving on to talk about the vestibular ocular uh, reflex in the MLF syndrome, <clears throat> we know that central pathways um, from the contralateral vertical semicircular canal uh, ascend through the MLF. And so if we were to test the horizontal um, vestibular ocular reflex using the head impulse test, which I know is being discussed in this lecture series and other times, then we notice that the 
velocity of the adducting eye movement. When we rapidly turn the head to one side, the eye has to adduct to stay on target. And that can occur even in people who have a noted INO um, related to MLF lesion. And that's thought to be from this accessory root or accessory tract called the ascending tract of Dieters, depicted here on the left, that does not run through the MLF, but rather directly connects the medial vestibular nucleus in, um, to cranial nerve three, along with the uh, nucleus of six, um, such that if you have a lesion, like a demyelinating lesion that affects the MLF, you'll have preserved adduction in, during the horizontal, um, uh, in the horizontal VOR during uh, bedside head and pulse testing. To touch briefly on bilateral MLF uh, injury, you can result in something called the wall-eyed bilateral INO, in which individuals can have dissociated abducting nystagmus, impaired convergence, as well as supranuclear vertical um, gaze palsy. And um, we'll take a look at one patient who had a paramedian midbrain lesion as, uh, in addition to bilateral MLF injury. Here we see the eyes are exodeviated or out bilateral INOs. He has preserved abduction in left gaze here and in right gaze here. There's diminished range in up gaze. Downbeat nystagmus in down gaze. This is another gentleman that um, had a similar uh, clinical appearance with exodeviation of his eyes um, that, uh, for whom the MRI of the brain is shown here on the right. Here we see preserved abduction of the right eye with diminished adduction of the left, preserved abduction of the left with diminished adduction of the right. And diminished convergence here. <clears throat> so moving on to um, wrap up here with the Miller-Gubler syndrome, which is another named syndrome involving a lesion of the basal caudal pons, again involving the fascicle of the sixth cranial nerve, the abducens, and the facial nerve, as well as the um, foraminal tract fibers that are important for movement. So these patients will have on the same side of their lesion diminished abduction, the eye coming out, facial weakness, and hemiparesis on the opposite side of the body. So they may have double vision and weakness on one side of the body. Foveal syndrome is um, uh, another uh, syndrome with conjugate gaze palsy and contralateral hemiparesis um, that can't be overcome by vestibulocular um, Here we see preserved gaze to the right with diminished conjugate gaze to the left. <clears throat> it's not overcome by VOR. Preserved to the right there. He also has a right-sided hemiparesis. So this lesion in the dorsal pons can affect, like we said, this abducens nucleus or PPRF, uh, leading to ipsilateral conjugate gaze palsy, <coughs> as well as the cortical spinal tract and the cranial nerve seven for facial um, weakness. Oftentimes this is caused by lesion in the perforating branches of the basilar artery, depicted here and running in the midline and feeding the pons. Horizontal gaze palsy can occur in the setting of
um, bilateral nuclear six nerve palsies, as we'll see in this individual, which is dorsal pontine hemorrhage. She has no gaze to the right and conjugate to, uh, lack of gaze to the left as well. V and is not able to be overcome by VOR. <clears throat> Vertically though, she has preservation with VOR. Also, just take this chance to comment about another condition that we sometimes see in neurology, especially in a place like the neurocritical care unit where people can come in after a major injury <clears throat> to their pond, where the only um, preservation of function that they have is preserved um, up gaze or down gaze of the eyes. And people will retain full consciousness, but not be able to move any of their um, body, not be able to speak, and not be able to look to either side because of a massive uh, injury in the pond, um, but they'll be cognitively intact. And this is a syndrome called locked-in syndrome, which some people may have uh, heard of, um, which is a relatively rare entity. Finally, the one and a half syndrome can come from involvement of uh, the sixth cranial nerve, um, as well as the MLF, um, leading to only preservation of one eye uh, being able to move out. Um, or abduct because of the preserved function of the contralateral six cranial nerve. Here we see preserved um, abduction of the left, but a right INO. <coughs> and then complete inability to move either eye to the right. And here's just another example of something from close to one and a half syndrome that some may have heard of called eight and a half syndrome, in which there's the same constellation of oculomotor deficits that we saw in that last video, but because of the close location of the seventh nerve fascicle for facial movement to the MLF and the sixth cranial nerve, there's also involvement of the face or facial weakness for seventh uh, cranial nerve palsy leading to this term eight and a half syndrome. individual had a demodian disease. So again, minimal eye movement to the left and preserved abduction to the right. There's also some vertical nystagmus up, eaten up. And uh, preserved ability to move the eyes in or adduct with convergence because of differences in the underlying anatomy that guides convergence. Finally, a little bit of subtle facial weakness on the left, consistent with this eight and a half syndrome in smiling and with eye closure. <clears throat> 
Great. So just to conclude, um, I know that was a very dense uh, lecture with a lot to learn, but I really feel that at the base of all these disorders, underlying understanding the fundamental anatomy of eye movement of the different pineal nerves is important and crucial for localization. So specifically mentioned, the MLF syndrome is a lot more uh, than just the INO. And motility deficits are really important for localizing lesions and demodulating processes and in neurovascular processes. But as neurologists, we're always relying on pattern recognition for localization in Pontine disorders and in midbrain disorders. So thanks so much to Dr. Gold, Dr. Pinto, and the Geno Group for inviting me to give this talk. And I really appreciate it and look forward to the opportunity to have further discussions with everyone here. Thanks again.